So you wanna be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. What's up, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Invest Relations Real Estate Podcast. I am your host, Johnny Katani, and I am joined today by Charles Seaman. He's a native of Brooklyn, New York, that currently resides in Charlotte, North Carolina, and serves as Senior Acquisition Manager and Asset Manager of Three Oaks Management LLC in which he actively works to locate high-performing multifamily real estate deals throughout the Southeast region of the United States. He's responsible for performing all of the company's initial underwriting and analysis of these deals, which ultimately determines whether or not the deal will be a good fit for the company. He's also involved with contract negotiation and capital raising to make sure that, he, that the deals close, remaining involved after closing to manage the assets, so they perform in a manner that provides investors with exceptional returns. Charles, welcome to the show. Jonathan, thanks for having me. It's a blast to be here tonight. Absolutely. So grateful to have you. We had a very awesome off-camera conversation. And for any listeners out there who have been listening this whole time, you know that that is one of my favorite things. I think I say that almost every time I go live on a show. I'm like, we had a great off because I just love having that sort of, you know, get to know you period and uh, get get the vibe going. You know what I mean? Yep. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you here. Um, a lot to get to. Uh, you're obviously very knowledgeable. Um, but let's kind of jump to the beginning. Um, haven't alluded to anything here. So talk to us about what you were doing in the beginning and, and what kind of led you to, to Three Oaks and, and uh, commercial real estate. Sure. So my path is probably a little bit different than a lot of the other people that get into this space because I wasn't so much seeking it out as much as I fell into it. <laughs> and when I first started, it wasn't that I, I said, oh, let me go out and become a commercial real estate investor. I I happened to be working for a, a guy who was a commercial real estate investor, amongst other things. And, you know, at that time, I was 20 years old and I was in need of a job and, and that's what was there. So you know, I had no college degree and I had no, uh, you know, I, I had limited prospects. So I took, I took what was in front of me. And the guy that I worked for owned multiple different businesses and properties. He owned a, a plumbing company, commercial real estate, bars and restaurants. And eventually my role there ex expanded to and help him manage all of those different businesses and properties. And of the different industries that I had ex exposure to, commercial real estate was always the one that I naturally gravitated to. And the reason I gravitated to it is because, this may sound strange, but it's simpler. It's simpler than the other ones. You know, commercial real estate is a solid asset class. It's something that has a lot of, a lot of relevancy all throughout history. You know, if you look even back to hundreds of thousands of years ago, the people that had wealth were the ones that controlled the land. That hasn't changed. So that, that's, that's still the same. So my thought was always, well, how do I get to be one of those people that controls the land? And I didn't have an answer to it back then. So uh, I just you know, I kept working where I was and eventually gained more responsibility. And my goal initially was when I was 20 years old was to stay there two or three years. And, you know, sometimes as life happens, you, you, you start doing better for yourself and gain more responsibility. And you, you, you think you become more important. I don't know if you really are. Sometimes maybe. But you become complacent because you start seeing things change and, and you know, at least what you perceive to be for the better. So fast forward about 10 years, you know, 2014, 2015, I, I've been there almost a decade at that point. And I... At this point, I was in my late 20s, and I knew that I didn't want to do that the rest of my life. And I wasn't fully sure what I wanted to do, but I knew that I always wanted to, to run my own business. And for me, I knew real estate was something I naturally enjoyed and I just you know, naturally gravitated to. So my goal was to see how I can get into that space. So what I knew right off the bat was I did not have the money to go out there and buy commercial real estate. So I dabbled in wholesaling, I dabbled in single family, you know, I hired a mentor in those, in those spaces. And after a while, uh, I gave up on it because I realized two things. One, just not, I wasn't good at it. And two, I didn't like it. So 
to me, I decided that wasn't the right path. I, I, I took a step back, continued working my day job. And fast forward to 2016, that was the first time I discovered syndication. And when, when I first learned about it, I said, oh, this makes sense. I said, you know what? I'm, I'm surprised I had never heard of this before here, but I had. So my first exposure to that led me to go to different seminars and different events as I was learning about it. And what I quickly realized was that would allow me a path forward that would let me be in the deals I want to be in, that would allow me to use the skills I already developed, and that would allow me to use other people's money. So I said, okay, this is a win-win scenario. So fast forward, you know, 2017 and 18, as I was taking different courses, you know, from mid 2017 on, I started actively looking for deals in the, in the multifamily space. And there's a lot of mistakes that I made along the way, you know, a lot of conventional wisdoms that people tell you to listen to that I decided not to, you know, I, there's always gotta be the one kid in there who you tell him don't touch the stove and he has to touch it anyway. That was usually me. Yeah. So likewise. You know, if you tell me do it this way, I just have to do it the other way. That's how I am. <laughs> so after making all those initial mistakes, you know, it took me about a year or so to kind of get them all out of my system. Then, then I started actually doing the things people told me from the beginning. And I realized, okay, well, we're starting to make progress now. So it, it, it took me nearly two years to get my, my first deal closed. And along that the way, I found the, the current partners that I'm working with. And then things started to take shape and we just worked together and started closing more deals. And that brings us to where we are now. Awesome. I love that. That's a, that's a cool story. So you worked with that investor. Sounds like you owned a, a lot of different businesses, one of which was, was investing curious did did you ever go get a college degree no yeah i don't i didn't graduate college so that's that's why i asked if you ever went back and got it awesome love that cool we can connect on that seems like yep. almost everyone has one so you it, know it, it's funny I, I always say you know i was a good student but I, I didn't enjoy school either so i i just couldn't see myself paying to not go to school because i didn't have a great attendance record in my senior year of high school <laughs> yep you're yeah i didn't learn that until I went through uh, about four semesters and then was like, okay, this is just a complete waste. So awesome. I love that. So how did you land that job? Is it someone you knew or is a family member? Yeah, or so you... It was a friend of the family. I went to high school with the, the owner's oldest son. It, it really, I knew the entire extended family. And I said, boy, you know, I, I never actually met him because he was never home. And, and after starting to work with him, I saw why I said, boy, this guy works you know, 20 hours a day. No wonder why I never saw him around the house. But that initial connection got me in the door. And then from that point, you know, I quickly became a valuable asset because even though I didn't know a lot when I first started, you know, I think what, what he naturally liked about me was that I, I always put the effort in. You know, I, I, for better or worse, I never said, no, I can't do this or no, I can't figure that out. Sometimes it's probably good to do that, but you learn that in, in retrospect. Um, you know, so, so I wound up basically taking on everything that other people didn't want to do or weren't willing to do or weren't able to do. And I, I said, okay, we're going to figure out how to get this done. And because of that, it, it gave me a lot of one-on-one -on -one time to work with a guy who was very successful and to learn from. Awesome. I love that. That's incredible. And that's so huge, right? Because at that age, being able to just, you know, Hey, I'll figure it out, you know, yeah. sort of a fake it till you make it kind of a thing, right. which I'm a huge proponent of, honestly. Yep. Um, awesome. And that's led you to now. So why Charlotte? What uh, caught your eye about that? And, and obviously, then you moved there so you can learn more about it. But uh, what, what caught your eye about that market? Sure. So initially, one of the mistakes that I was alluding to before was not picking a target market. So when we first started out, you know, I met my, my, my two current partners about four or five months after I started. And we joined forces almost immediately, you know, within a month or two of meeting. And you know, initially we were looking at deals anywhere east of the Mississippi River, which for anybody with a map, you know, that, that's a lot of ground. You know, one month I was in Ohio, one month I was in Indiana, twice I was in Kentucky, one of my partners went to Tennessee. So after about a year of looking at all different areas, we finally got smart and chose a target area. And we, we started thinking about it logically. So for me, my goal was to move to, what, to wherever that target area was. So in retrospect, Charlotte's certainly better than some of the other choices we were considering. So I'm glad we went with that. But because I figured, how do you know the market better than by living and working there every day? So one of, one of the partners already lived in Charlotte and I lived in New York. So I knew for sure that wasn't going to be the market. And we, we wanted something that had good tenant landlords. We wanted something that had positive momentum. 
So something that was growing, you know, so the Southeast and the Sunbelt region as a whole are experiencing tremendous growth and, and the growth is expected to continue because you have a lot of inward migration with people who are leaving other cities and other states for these, these warmer climates and more favorable tax laws and things like that. So my thought was being one of the partners already lived in Charlotte, you know, I said, well, why don't we just make that the market? You know, we're, we're really overthinking this. I said, you live in one of the best markets. And I think one of the mistakes people make in this business is that, yes, you could do it from anywhere. There is truth to that, but it's a heck of a lot easier if it's somewhere that you can drive to as opposed to somewhere you need to jump on a plane and get to every time. I couldn't agree more, honestly. And certainly, you know, of course, most people that we talk to do not live where in, in their market. Um, so, you know, by no means do you have to do it, but it right. does make it a lot easier. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm building, we're building a, a self storage facility and it's 30 minutes from my house. Right. So it's like at any moment I can just be like, okay, I need to go out there to meet the engineer or whatever it is, you know? Right. And that just, you know, and then that limits the need for boots on the ground, which then adds another partner and, and not that those things are bad, but it just, right. It's certainly, I think a lot more, uh, it's a lot more advantageous. Agreed. Awesome. I love that. So uh, talk about, you know, what you met your partners uh, pretty early on. What has been kind of the keys to your guys' you know, success as, as partners and then, you know, kind of the growth and, and strategy? Well, you know, I think the key with any partnership is you have to find a, a synergy. And sometimes that synergy might be complementary skill sets. So if, if one person is good at, you know, finding deals and the other one's good at finding money, then that might be a match. Uh, you need to have probably some congruence in terms of values and beliefs and also in terms of work ethic. You know, because that's going to go a long way if one person's putting in all the effort and the other one's not, then eventually you're, you're going to wind up becoming disgruntled. So you, you need to be similar in many fronts. I think you need to really have similar goals and similar visions for the business. And sometimes what you may find is those things change over time. Maybe what it was when you started out might be different than when, when you're five years in. So you always have to reevaluate and say, okay, you know, is the the partnership that I'm with the right, the right spot for me? Is this where I need to be right now? Or do, or do I need to do something different? And you know, just like many situations in life, things change, people change. So you need to figure out what's best for you and what's best for the, for the company and just you know, do whatever makes the most sense at that time. Awesome. I love that. It's so true and such a great perspective because um, it's, it's so important. Those complementary skills, I think that's probably the most universal sort of anonymous um, unanimous answer that I get, right, is, is because if you all do the same thing, it's really, you're just, you know, right, wasting your time more or less. Um, yeah. and, so and I, I think one of the mistakes people make is that as they wind up, you know, not really assessing that properly, you can have a problem. So the purpose of the complementary skill sets is you're trying to do more of it in-house. So it gets more lucrative and more advantageous for everybody. When you're when you're keeping a bigger piece of the pie so if you can start doing more you know that just works out better for everybody absolutely now are you do you guys uh manage all your own are you guys vertically integrated not yet eventually that may happen but uh we, we've kind of talked around and tossed the idea back and forth a few times but we we haven't pulled the trigger yet <laughs> fair enough makes sense definitely um it kind of depends right i, I you kind of get mixed um answers when it comes to uh, whether or not it's the right time to do that or, or whether or not you should do it. Um, sometimes it's forced. You can never find good property managers. Other right. times, you know, you want to wait till you have that, that large portfolio and the economic, you know, the economic side of it makes sense. Right. Um, it's always finding the balancing act, you know? So the thing is when, when you're starting with smaller properties, like with us, most of our initial properties were in the 50 to hundred unit range. The goal now is really to be hundred units and up. One, because we can compete there, and two, because you know we want things with full-time staff. It's so much easier to run a property when you have full-time staff than when you don't. So, you know, when, when you're starting with those smaller properties, 50, 60, 70 units, even smaller than that, it's going to be tough to find good management because generally the good management companies want the bigger, better properties. You know, they they don't want the 30-unit property that's two hours outside of the city in the tertiary market. 
Uh, you're not going to see the, you know, the, the top-notch management companies lining up to fight for that. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, you're, no, you're exactly right. It, it's so true. Um, but that is, that is that nice sort of middle ground, uh, especially getting started, you know, uh, because so many people want that hundred plus that 200 yep. plus. Um, so it's a great way to get going when you're right. just getting started, especially if all of you, all of your partners are just getting started. Like a lot of times someone will join and like, oh yeah, this, my partner already had 20 years experience. But if all of you are brand new and you, you all compliment each other, like you're like, oh yeah, this would be a good partnership. That's a great, uh, asset, you know, subclass basically right. to, to get started in yep. for sure. So, um, obviously some, a lot of things changing in the economic landscape, anything changing for you guys in terms of strategy approach, uh, you know, the, anything the you guys thing are I would doing say, differently? You know, right now as we record this, it's you know, mid-May, 2022. And, you know, I, I've heard a lot of groups I know that are sitting on the sidelines at this point. We're not doing that, but we're certainly looking at things through a different lens. Uh, we are being more conservative. And as much as it hurts my heart to say this, I'm, I'm underwriting everything with an interest rate of six at this point. Uh, and that's even higher than where rates are now as we record this. But the reality is we're only a Fed meeting or two away from that. And by the end of the summer, and even by the time we close any deals that we would get on the contract out, that's probably where we're going to wind up. So we, we are using higher interest rates in our, in our underwriting at the current time. We're also using higher terminal cap rates, which the, the double whammy of those two things will probably make us a lot less competitive on deals in the next few months. But I think it's better to miss out on a few than to get a few that we're going to regret. Absolutely. What, what do they say? Sometimes the best deal is the one that you walk away from. Right. And, and maybe if I was just starting out, I would have had a different approach because you know, you're always hungry and you want that first deal. And, and even in 2017 and 18 and 19, when I started out in, in the multifamily syndication side, I thought a lot of the deals I looked at were overpriced then. And, and, and quite frankly, if, if it, you know, it's always clear in hindsight, but boy, I could have paid any price back then. I would have made money on it, apparently. Yeah, I've had this conversation on, on multiple episodes. Um, it will be interesting to see. And, and I fall into this category of brand new, right? Like I'm working on my first deal under my own umbrella, did, did a bunch of deals last year with another firm. But, um, you know, in the last three years, you could basically just trip and 2x your deal. Right. You know, and That's so true. it'll be interesting to see moving forward, these operators who have had that sort of enjoyed that luxury of how they, you know, it'll basically bring out the, the best because you'll have to really have an actual business plan. Right. Uh, going into you, it. You, you'll see who the strong operators are and who the ones aren't. Yes, I, I agree with that. Absolutely. So what um, for you, you know, how do you determine if a deal is right for you? So there's a couple of things we do. I mean, the first is, you know, going forward, we're probably going to be stricter on our criteria for both unit count and purchase price. And in the past, it was something we, you know, we had, but we may have waved a little more on because when you're first starting out, sometimes you can't always get what you want. And, you know, we initially were targeting hundred plus unit deals, but we realized after, you know, a year and a half, two years, we weren't really competitive on them. So that's when we made the decision to shift down to 50 because we said, okay, let's adjust our criteria to 50 to hundred units or 50 and up because we actually stand the chance of winning in this space. And then after we got a few of those, uh, now we can actually compete in the 100 plus unit space. So I don't think we want to take a step back there. And it's not to say that you can't find some decent deals. Truthfully, you could probably find better deals in, that, in those spaces because there's less competition. But you, you also have a tougher time managing it. That's one of the things you learn. Uh, probably another thing, and I'm not going to say this definitively because I'm kind of mulling this over in my own head, but all of our success so far has been in C-class properties and not a bad space to be in, but eventually we'd like to graduate and, and start doing some Bs and, and maybe even an A here and there. So, you know, I think we, we are actively looking at those. And I think the goal is to win at least one of those this year so we can get something in a different asset class and maybe start scaling up a little bit as opposed to C stuff. So I think we'll, we'll just be stricter on criteria. And I think one of the, the advantages you have is that as you start you know, closing some deals and getting a little traction, you can start being a little more selective with that. You know, the, the good news is by a certain point, you develop rapport with the brokers, you have credibility with them, and, you know, they have 
pay continue to close the deal. So they'll start usually bringing you more deals than you can handle anyway. Absolutely. And taking them to lunch definitely helps. Right. <laughs> you know, it, it may be a dirty word in today's, in today's society, but smooth. Smoozing goes a long way. Oh my gosh. So far. I mean, anybody that I ever talked to about developing broker relationships, like when I was first starting out was like, if you're not going to go and shake their hand in person and like visit them, then you can plan on probably not getting the right. best deals from them. And that was actually part of my reason for moving to the target market. It's a lot easier for me to do that. So I don't have to jump on a plane every time. Absolutely. And as the, the senior acquisition manager, that's like, you know, you're, you're the go-to guy for, for those relationships. Um, so you're the senior acquisition manager and the asset manager. So what skill sets allow you to find it, but then also be the one who's, you know, kind of managing there at the end? Lack of sleep. No. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. But, but uh, it's probably also having experience and having worked in the industry. So one of the advantages I had over a lot of people is that even though I was just starting out in syndication in 2017, I'd already worked for a commercial investor for more than a decade. So commercial real estate wasn't new to me. It was something that you know I had an advantage because I was able to work with somebody very successful and to learn from them. And I was able to work with him on all sides of the business. Now, granted, he was in a different position in the sense that he, he used his own capital, so he didn't need to go out there and raise capital for investors. Uh, I knew that I, that I wasn't going to be in that position. So the capital raising side was new to me, but finding a property and running a property and things like that were, were things I probably could have done in my sleep so they didn't bother me. And I think just having that experience and having already learned how to do those things gave me a lot of confidence to step into it. Absolutely. And that's, that's uh, a, such a great perspective because asset management is, is very underrated in terms of its importance and again, the last few years, you could trip and 2x, but now we're getting to that point where now it's becoming, you know, kind of the, the very, the, one of the most important parts of the business strategy and implementing the business strategy. So right. what are some things you mentioned, you're mostly in the C class, which typically means for value add, you're going to be a little bit more of, of a heavy lift. Yep. Um, so, so what are some some main, you know, things that, that you like to utilize in terms of, you know, implementing that strategy. So what, what I'm going to say may surprise you, but the, the answer I'm going to give you is I'd rather keep it simple. I think some, I think a lot of people overcomplicate it. And, you know, when, when you're dealing with tenants in that space, they're not looking for a luxury unit. You know, they, they want something clean, comfortable, safe, which is, you know, the verbiage that you probably hear a lot of people say in this space. But there's truth to it. Clean, comfortable, safe doesn't mean granite countertops. It doesn't mean, you know, upgraded flooring. And, and if you give them those things, great. But that's not what they need. You know, the C tenant is a tenant by, by necessity. They're not, they're not somebody who's renting by choice. That's the A tenant. That person may buy a house. They may rent an apartment. Maybe they rent the apartment because they don't want the responsibility of a house. Uh, the C tenant is somebody who needs a roof over their head and what they want is to be treated like a decent human being and have their, their workloads addressed and have, and have their, their housing provided. So a lot of people think, oh, let me go spend X amount on, on a unit. But you don't always need to do that. You know, sometimes it's just how you manage the property, how you serve the tenants and, and how you treat the tenants. And that can go a long way. Simple things like that, just common courtesy and, and common sense, you know, can bring you pretty far in it. You know, I think oftentimes, that's going to bring you better results. Like when I first started in this, in this space, my thought would have been similar to many people go in there, spend money on units, upgrade them because people are going to pay extra for it. But most times in the C space, that's not, not really true. I mean, you may get a little pop, but not much. They're paying more because they want a place that, that they can come home to at night after work and know that they're safe and know that they have heat and know they have a roof and know they have all the, the necessities they should. You'd be surprised how many, landlords don't provide those things. So because of that, simply doing the basics, you can get far ahead. Yeah, it is fascinating how often going drilling down to those basics is such a, you know, a great recipe for success. Because like you said, so many people are overcomplicating it, that just taking over an asset and 
fulfilling work orders is all of a sudden like, you know, you've boosted not only morale, but now people are willing to pay extra and want to stay right. there. So you get the stickier tenants and, and all of that as well. Now, yeah. do you guys typically go in and rebrand and kind of change, you know, the, the oh. whole... Only if needed. So, so the, the preference is not to rebrand because it costs more and it's just more of a hassle in general. But if we see the property has an absolute terrible reputation online, then we'll go in there and rebrand just to clean it up and start fresh. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Uh, if it's already got a, a, a good good reputation, no reason to change it. But typically you see those C-class. They, I feel like it's either one or the other with, with that asset class. Right. Awesome. So... So as you're, you know, kind of implementing this strategy, um, are, are there any other, like anything else that you're looking for in terms of being able to add value or is it pretty much just that simple kind of basics? So for me, a management play is my favorite hundred percent of the time. You know, if I, if I, if you give me a choice of a management play or a physical upgrade, I'm going to take the management play every single time. Uh, now, now it's not to say there's not a place for physical upgrades, but to me, there's a lot more risk there. And the challenge with it is you're, you're, you're saying, okay, I'm going to budget X amount to go in there and upgrade these units. So there's a couple of risks. One, you know, there's the risk that pricing might change, especially in the volatile market we've had in the last year or two, you know, supplies aren't readily available, you know, su supplies cost a lot more than you expect, you know, so, okay. So you want, you want to get your stove here and three days as opposed to three months. Well, okay, we're going to triple the price for you. You know, so that happens. So when you're going in there upgrading, there's a lot of, a lot of variables that prevent, present more risk. And the other risk is that even after you do that, you don't really know if you're going to be able to hit the rent projection you set. You're kind of thinking you will, but you don't really know until you get out there and test it and say, okay, how did this one go? So to me, if I can avoid that risk by, by just having a management plan, I'll take that every single time. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm going to butcher this, but more or less, um, you know, cutting expenses. What do they say? Cutting expenses better than increasing revenue. I butchered that. It, for sure. There's some truth to that because in, in certain regards, it's more controllable. And, you, you know, there are certain things you can't cut. You're not going to go in there and, and cut your property tax, unfortunately. You're not going to go in there most times and cut your insurance. At least I wouldn't if I was in syndication. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. Uh, you, you know, there, there are certain things you're just not going to cut. Payroll, maybe you cut a little bit, but if you're going to keep the existing staff, it's never a smart idea to budget for less. But then there's certain things you can do better on. So maybe you can do better on the contract services or the vendors that you're using or different things that can present cost-saving opportunities to the property. Maybe you could find a way to be more energy efficient, especially if it's a 70s or 80s vintage property. You know, it's a lot easier to find ways that you can go in there and make the property more energy efficient for water. You know, you go in there and you replace, you know, flappers on bowls and aerators and things like that. And you'd be surprised what type of impact that could have. So, so things like that, that can save money. Those, those will go a long way and you can start reducing some of those expenses. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Uh, in that uh, C class, is there a lot of loss to lease or is it pretty, do they keep it pretty, um, pretty tight. Yeah, it's interesting. So it'll really vary widely from owner to owner. And one thing I've seen more and more in the last few months, and I, I can't really blame sellers for doing this because it's not a bad strategy, but in particular, as they're getting ready to sell, I'll see a lot of them start bumping up the gross potential rent, which is going to leave a bigger loss to lease. And sometimes they'll even bump it up so much that they might already account or any value it or any or any rent bump you might get from increasing the you know from do, doing a unit upgrade, and that'll usually leave a tremendous loss to lease. So it really varies. There are some that you know if it's a real mom and pop owner they they may not have any loss to lease at all. Sometimes they may even have a gain to lease. Uh, then you'll get some of the the smarter operators that as they're ramping up and getting ready to sell, they're going to keep pushing the gross potential rent, and as they do that, it's going to widen the gap on the loss to lease and keep resetting it. So you'll see both sides depending on the operator. Interesting. Makes sense. Uh, so a property tax is pretty normal, relatively speaking, in, in North Carolina. I know in uh, Texas, they're astronomical. Unfortunately, they're astronomical everywhere. Uh, so that doesn't sure. change. But one thing I would say that's good about North Carolina is that it's not a point to sale state. So what that nice. means is that the state 
and the county did not automatically reassess the property's value upon a sale. At some point, they are going to take that value into account, but it'll be whenever the next scheduled revaluation is. Where, whereas some states like South Carolina, for instance, is a point the sale stage. So that means when you sell your property, the, the county assessor is going to want their money sooner than later. So they're going to come out and reassess the value of the property pretty soon. Yeah, a lot of states are like that. We did deals in Ohio last year. They're the same way. You know, so then you're trying to assume as much as, you know, as much as you can. And, um, you know, we're kind of getting away from that. That strategy being advantageous, unfortunately. But um, yeah, so I was just kind of curious there. Awesome. Well, I've really appreciated this uh, perspective and all of your insight. Um, we're kind of coming up on time here. So I've got five questions I ask all of my guests. Um, sure. It's the final five. Uh, what's the best advice you've gotten from a mentor? Don't quit. Keep, keep, keep it simple. Don't quit. You know what? You, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have times you get frustrated. You're going to have times that you come home from work and you're tired. You're going to have times when life gets in the way. You can use all of those as excuses. And that's what they'll be if you let them. Don't quit. Find a way to rise up above that. And then eventually you'll find a way to achieve your goal. I love that. So awesome. I love your philosophy of keep it simple. Um, it sounds like you apply that to pretty much everything. And I love that so much. Uh, what is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? So I've always enjoyed commercial real estate. I, I, I think I look at it as a game of human chess, which is kind of ironic because I've never played chess. But <laughs> I, I look at it kind of as a game of human chess where it's like, okay, you know, somebody makes a move and then I have to make a counter move. And I always enjoy that. And I enjoy trying to figure out, okay, how, how do I outgame the gamesmen? And commercial real estate certainly has a lot of that. And to me, that, that makes me feel fulfilled. I enjoy that type of stuff. And Absolutely. I enjoy the interactions with people and just, you know, being around people and interacting with them in this business on a regular basis. Well, that was it a culture shock to go from Brooklyn to Charlotte? It was definitely different. Yes. Uh, a total culture shock. And I may even somewhat ready for it but i think going from brooklyn to anywhere is probably a culture shock that's very fair <laughs> yeah i can tell you at uh, 16 going from atlantic city new jersey to uh well it was, i mean salt lake city it was uh was a culture shock for sure yep. um favorite non-real estate or investment related book how to win friends and influence people huge love it it's actually uh, my favorite book of all time nice awesome that's a great one uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, you know, there's so many of them out there, but any superpower, ooh. Well, you know, I, I think probably the, the greatest super, superpower you can have is one that's going to allow you to help with yourself and help other people. Uh, but maybe having the ability to have an infinite amount of time. Because uh, having more time gives you the ability to help more people and help yourself and to do things that you need to. Gosh, that's so true. I wish. <laughs> yeah, but we all have a very finite amount, so that's that, that's a good superpower, but not one that I have. <laughs> Absolutely, for sure. <laughs> uh, cool. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you and learn more? Sure. So, it can be a few different ways. The first is by text, and that's three four seven three zero six three two seven eight. And the second is by email, and that's charles at investorboardroom dot com. Awesome. Charles, thank you again so much for all of your time and, and your insight. I really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you know when the next video is coming out. Even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know it's coming out the next day. Um, we have a ton of content coming your way. So please like and subscribe. It helps a ton. Leave comments. We'd love to know what you guys think. And uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.